A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week, a kidnapping in the middle of a custody battle has made international headlines. The two children, ages 10 and 13, are the children of an heiress to a German steakhouse fortune. Their mother has been in a nasty custody battle with their father. The children were with their father on New Year's Eve at a cafe watching fireworks when a group of men kidnapped the children in two separate cars. Police say they are investigating if this abduction has anything to do with the custody battle. But first, a nurse in Florida has been arrested and charged, accused of killing her neighbors, two kittens and a pregnant chihuahua. The sheriff said she allegedly put pesticide on some chicken and fed it to the pets because she may have been angry about them stepping in her yard. When the family found all their animals dead, they called police, and while calls like this often are given very low priority, the animal cruelty agents took this one seriously. It took months of investigating the poison and three universities to figure out what killed the animals. But we are one step closer to getting justice for Luna, Pancake, and Little Daisy, who was pregnant with eight puppies. We are recording this on Wednesday, January 10th of 2024. Our guest today is Robert Corbett, a criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor from North Carolina. Robert is also a dear friend of the show. Robert, welcome. You are the first guest of the first show of the new year. We're so thrilled to have you. Oh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on the time zone. And thank you. I didn't realize that honor, but I am much appreciated. Oh, we're thrilled to have you. It's always such a pleasure. You know, you have this this kindness, compassion, yes, yet, you know, um, defense of the law and support for victims' rights. And and I think it's because you've had those two hats as a criminal defense attorney and as a pro- and as a prosecutor. So we just love your perspective on the show. No, oh, thank you. I think always said in terms of working on both sides just just help me in terms of to, I think, properly evaluate cases sometimes. Well, we've got two very different cases today. And the one we're going to start with first is out of Lakeland, Florida. And this one is very disturbing because it's about animal cruelty. Um, this, this case really got me. And as you know, on this program, we always talk about crimes against the vulnerable. And we're talking about children, the elderly, people with uh, challenges, and of course, also innocent animals. And you know, this is the kind of case where police agencies often don't have the resources or the people power. And what I want to remind everyone before you all like say, wait a minute, you know, what about murders and and carjackings? The investigative team in charge of this case, dedicated animal cruelty agents. So no resources were taken away from law enforcement to deal with all of those human crimes. I want to make that clear. It's really important. Um, And it's important that we have these agents to investigate. Um, You know, a killing is a killing. And we we just we need to discuss these cases. And I'm so impressed with how this case was handled. And the sheriff, my goodness, Robert, I'm so impressed by the amount of time the sheriff gave to explain this case to the community. Well, I think I agree in terms of these types of cases. You don't normally see them receive this type of attention. Doesn't mean that a crime has not been committed. But in this particular instance, to have a dedicated unit, this is a case that probably somewhere else would not have gone, would not have been solved, at least not solved as quickly. Absolutely. And again, you know, we can't make a choice between people, um, humans and animals. But if we can find a way to protect them all, we'd be much closer to a more perfect world. No, sir. Right. sir. So let's let's talk about this case. So 51-year-old Tamisha Knighton has been charged with three counts of felony animal cruelty and one count of depositing poison in a public area. She is accused of poisoning her neighbor's two cats, Luna and Pancake, And a four-year-old chihuahua named Daisy, who was pregnant with eight puppies at the time. We're going to put up their photos. For those of you who are listening, I just, just picture Daisy in this picture. She's wearing a little dress. 
She's like a beige, tan chihuahua, big ears, looks like a deer head, and she's got a little bow on her dress, and she was pregnant with eight puppies. You know, and kittens, I mean, what's more innocent than a kitten? Now, Tamisha says she is innocent, completely innocent. The sheriff says that Tamisha allegedly admitted to feeding the animals out of love, but investigators claim that she laced the food with insecticide. It's also shocking that the person who is accused here, accused, innocent until proven guilty, is a licensed practical nurse, someone who we look to in our community, not to do harm, but to help us. Yeah, in terms of, I think it's natural for certain professions we may put on looking at certain light and people who are charged to give aid and care, we don't think or we don't like to think that they will be capable of doing something like this. It's so disturbing. And when I tell you the details of this, y'all are going to get so upset. So on August 16th of 2023, last summer, deputies responded to a very unusual call. The couple said that their two cats, Luna and Pancake, were foaming at the mouth. They were choking and appeared to be suffering like intense pain. It was, it was like, I know what you're thinking. Why don't you call the vet? But clearly there are some reasons which we will share based on what the neighbor said as to why they thought this wasn't just, you know, a, a disease or something that the kittens were dealing with. Officers arrived on the scene just in time to witness the death of one of the cats. And the animal officers said it was horrific, that what they watched, what they witnessed was unbearable, the suffering and the pain. And it gets worse. Everyone, please excuse me. I'm getting over a cold. So, so forgive me here with my voice. Four hours after the deaths of those two cats, the couple is searching for their pregnant dog, Daisy. Well, they found Daisy. She was dead. And so were the eight puppies that she was carrying. Here is the Polk County Sheriff, Grady Judd, showing such kindness and, and such emotion as he describes the victims in this case. Go to the clip. There were three victims. And our three victims were Daisy. Here's the, a chihuahua. She's about four years old. And she was pregnant with eight puppies. There were two kittens, or young cats, one named Pancake and the other named Luna. And they were loved by their family. The children and all of the victims of the family are devastated because on August 16th, the three of these died. And they died because they were poisoned. And we arrested the person that was responsible for that. Robert, I have to admit, I was so surprised to see the sheriff up there with such passion describing these victims and with with such conviction and authority saying, and we got the person. I mean, um, again, over the poisoning of three animals. Well, the thing that kind of jumps out with me when you talk about in terms of the conviction or the certainty of law enforcement, and this is my defense hat coming on, like you said, innocent until proven guilty, law enforcement can tend to go over the line, so to speak, in terms of saying this is 100 percent the person because otherwise they wouldn't have charged or try to arrest the person. But they're still in terms of things that have to be looked at from both sides. And there's still a viable case for the defense to present in this type of case. Absolutely. We'll go through the evidence which the sheriff's department says that they have collected. And the question will be. Can prosecutors really make their case and prove that we do believe that the food was poisoned and the animals were poisoned? But the question will be, were they intentionally poisoned and who did it? <laughs> so investigators quickly turned to the neighbor once they had these three animals. After the couple told authorities that their neighbor had previously, they said, previously threatened to poison the pet's for entering her yard. What's the value of that, Robert? Well, it's certainly in terms of with every case, you look at whether you have means, motive, and opportunity. So the fact of the neighbors or the, the pet owners giving this statement to the police in terms of how the neighbor, Tamisha, reacted or acted towards her, their pets, that certainly provides a motive and is certainly grounds for, excuse me, grounds for law enforcement to follow up with that to see that, hey, there may have been some bad blood, so to speak, between these two parties. But let's see in terms of 
would that bad blood spill over to the level of where it would cause her to intentionally harm these pets? So the couple and the family, they've not been named. Uh, they allegedly told police that they saw Tamisha pacing the shared fence line between the neighboring residences. The victims here, the family, the parents, say that their children were out playing ball and she allegedly shouted at the children to stop. I don't know if they were making too much noise or what. And then the parents say that they warned the neighbor, Tamisha, to not yell at their children. So you can see where this is starting to brew as a dispute between neighbors, which I always say are among the most dangerous. Yes, and it goes, it's starting to get to that point of where it goes beyond just the simple, the disputes you may see in terms of neighbors, in terms of, you know, day to day, but this seems to have, or potentially escalated to even like something more. Correct. One of the cats at this point, this is after the kill, the children had been in the yard, one of the cats started foaming at the mouth and it, and as life is slipping away, the family told police that Tamisha made a comment saying, well, the cat was likely choking on a frog. I don't know what value of any of that has in the investigation. It's just an odd thing to say. Tamisha has denied any involvement in the poisoning of the these three animals. I know the tempers are running hot on this case, so I want to keep reminding everyone she's denying this. So the question would be, okay, what killed the animals? Were they choking on frogs or what happened to them? So only tests on the animals themselves and the food that they ate would answer this question. And the other thing is, did they possibly get into any kind of ant poison or were they intentionally poisoned by someone else? Because one of the things that the neighbor said was, look, I put some um, ant repellent around my house because I'm having problems with ants. If the animals got into that. I'm sorry, but that's, you know, kind of on them. So it was very important for this case to figure out, is that what the animals ate or did they eat something else? Right? Because this was key here. So Investigators say that they discovered a styrofoam bowl on Tamisha's property that allegedly contained chicken strips and some dark material. Police say that Tamisha originally denied placing the bowl on her property, um, said, saying, I don't even have styrofoam balls, uh, bowls. And then the police said, well, then what's this stack of styrofoam bowls in your kitchen here? To which she said, oh, well, maybe it is mine. So there, there, there's been a lot of, you know, story changing here. Uh, according to the authorities. Uh, now, Tamisha has a camera on her property and police asked to look at the camera. They claim that a review of the security footage is actually, they say, incriminating. They say the surveillance video and the photos which we're putting up for those of you who are listening, you see Tamisha wearing blue gloves, like plastic blue gloves, holding a styrofoam bowl, with some white and brown substance. Again, we don't, we, we're not gonna know exactly what's in there. What do you think the value of that video is, Robert, in this case? Well, I, mean, I heard someone once say, when you say that a picture can be worth a thousand words, then a video can be worth a thousand pictures. Uh, and what, when I hear in terms of the statements that she gave to the police, sort of makes me think of in terms of whenever you have a criminal case, it's always best if you are the accused or someone under investigation that you keep quiet. You never do. It is a disservice for you to talk. And it is even worse when you give conflicting information or something that you know is untrue. In this case, if she is involved, she doesn't gain anything by giving different stories to the police. If she is involved, it certainly does. She doesn't gain anything by turning over evidence to the police that shows her doing something incriminating, such as leaving a bowl and wearing gloves as if she's trying to protect herself from whatever is in this bowl. So it just goes towards in terms of people who kind of commit these types of acts aren't thinking clearly. And if they were, there'd be no need for me or anybody else in my profession. I'm curious, when the police said, oh, can we look at your video, was she at all legally obligated to turn it over? 
Oh, not at all. And that is a voluntary contact between Tamisha and law enforcement. At this point, it doesn't sound as if that they had a search warrant. If they had a search warrant, then they could have obtained the video. But they're asking her, I may say something along the lines of, you have nothing to hide, let us look at it. So she turns it over. But obviously, or it appears she may have had something to hide or there may have been something that she regrets law enforcement now has access to. But what if she doesn't have something to hide? What if she really did just give them chicken? I'm just, I'm, you know, looking at the other side here. What if she really did feed them and then she's like, oh no, the cats are dead. They're going to blame me. I just fed, fed them. You know, I, I'm not going to say what I believe here right now. Um, but is it possible that if she didn't poison them, as she says, that saying, okay, here's my video. Well, it's certainly possible, and she has denied um, any wrongdoing, and if she has counsel or when she obtains counsel, that's something certainly they will be talking about. But what the prosecution, what law enforcement has is circumstantial evidence, which is counts the same as direct evidence, circumstantial, leading you to a certain conclusion. So they can say, one, the pets are dead, two, the pets did not die from ingesting ant repellent, which is what Tamisha's original story appears to be. And three, we have video of Tamisha presenting a bowl and wearing gloves as if she is trying to protect herself from whatever may be inside that bowl or trying not to have contact. So that is a strong circumstantial evidence case for law enforcement and the prosecution. And they may say if she's going to deny that or say it was some other means, then she would have to come forward or present a better story than what she's already done already. So here's what happened when Tamisha was confronted with that video we've been discussing, you know, about this bowl and if it had food in it. Here's the sheriff again. When we talked to Tamisha over this period of time, she totally lied about everything. She said, I do put chicken out to feed the neighborhood animals because I care for them. That was her excuse when we showed the photograph here. Well, why would you be wearing rubber gloves to handle food that you were just putting out because you like the animals? Okay. You know, the sheriff makes a good point there. Um, he's claiming that she's lying. The story's not making sense. And um, he's kind of like a no-nonsense cop here at the podium. Yeah, and that's certainly in terms of enough to go forward, enough to charge, and then the onus may be on her to have to, to rebut that. So she's still innocent until proven guilty, but it certainly appears to be sufficient evidence to move forward. So Tamisha, you know, ultimately, according to police, says that she left the bowl out for the neighborhood animals, claiming that the brown substance was her special seasoning. Anyone who has animals knows you don't put seasoning on food, not because most of the time animals don't react well to seasoning. They have to eat bland food. But that aside, now despite her changing the story several times, at the time of this incident, when she was investigated, she was not arrested at the time because police still had to figure out what this case was. We still, you know, in real time, we're back in August, um, they, they have to decide, okay, what killed the animals? What was in the food? So um, Polk County has a dedicated animal cruelty investigative unit, as we said at the beginning of the podcast, two full-time detectives committed to cases like this. So the investigative unit also received some support from the agricultural unit that the sheriff has, another investigative unit. And then three universities had to help out here because they had to exhume one of the cats and there was a lot of analysis. They needed samples from the victims. They needed samples from the styrofoam bowl that was collected by the police. Okay, here's more from the sheriff and the investigation. So the question is, how much work does it take to make a case like this? Well, we leave no stone unturned. We had to send samples <clears throat> to the University of Florida. The University of Florida then worked with Texas A&M. Texas A&M then worked with Michigan State in order for us to determine 
the poison that was used and that we had to tie the poison to the various animals back to the source. And here's what we determined. We determined that Tamisha Knighton, here's her wearing rubber gloves and carrying the poison in a styrofoam bowl. There were small chicken strips that she, that she put, as she called it, her special seasoning on it. And she put her special seasoning on the chicken strips. They were in the bowl, and then she set them out. And that's where Daisy, Pancake, and Luna consumed them and ultimately died of poisoning. Now, in a minute, why do I show you this picture from this video clip? Because she denies everything, as you can imagine. According to the sheriff, the deaths were caused by a highly con concentrated amount of forate, leading investigators to believe that Tamisha's special seasoning may have been deadly. While forate is a commonly used insecticide that you can buy in any garden shop or any place like that, Scientists determined it was not an ant repellent. They were able to clearly identify the substance. So that, you know, kicks out the ant repellent story based on this scientific evidence. So months later, after they have all the results back from all of this testing, Tamisha was taken to jail on January 4th of this year, of 2024. She was booked on three counts of animal cruelty, one count of depositing poison in public, and authorities so far have not confirmed whether she's bailed out yet or not. Now, um, the sheriff says she has a little bit of a criminal history. The sheriff says that back in September of 2013, she was arrested for aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, um, and supposedly still remains behind bars right now, pending a court appearance on the cat and the dog deaths. Yeah, it's not a slam dunk case, so to speak. Uh, as I said, certainly enough to go forward. What prosecution and law enforcement will want to know or try to figure out or what they're trying to do now, I'm, I'm sure, is is there anything in her home or any search that shows that she may have purchased either this poison or something that contains those ingredients or those chemicals that would be more in terms of closing the loop to say that she is the person involved whereas now she still has we can still argue that hey i fed the animals or i did leave food out and yes, I did in terms of use some type of seasoning um, as I've done in, in the past. And whatever caused the death of these animals, that was some intervening act, something that had nothing to do with me, whether it's someone else who came in, whether they went somewhere else and ingested this, but I had nothing to do with it. So they still need to find, I would think, in terms of some link to that particular poison. And the sheriff had some final words for people who are having disputes with their neighbors. Uh, um, a, a final thought from the sheriff. If you're having problems with neighbors and their animals, resolve it with a neighbor peacefully and appropriately and legally or contact my animal investigations unit. Let us help figure out a resolution with you. Do not ever poison innocent animals, unless, of course, you want to go to jail as well. Yes, do not poison innocent animals. Don't hurt any living thing. Um, man, this this case, I, I really, I have to applaud the team in Polk County. You know, I, I love animals, as many of you know. I am a foster and a volunteer for a rescue here in Los Angeles called A Purposeful Rescue. And um, the idea of harming an animal, it just, it just undoes me. And then a chihuahua that was pregnant, I can't even. Now, the sheriff did say clearly that because of the laws, and usually laws protecting animals are very, very weak, they could not add any extra charges on the um, pregnant chihuahua, on the unborn puppies, that the laws just did not apply to that.
Yeah, and I can I get uh, now that you say that, I guess I can I can see and, and understand that. And sometimes our, our laws can be can be lacking and not cover every unforeseen circumstance. But it does appear in this case, at first I was thinking that they went above and beyond, but it's probably not even fair to say that. This was a thorough investigation and that it was fortunate that law enforcement had certain avenues or certain resources that they were able to use, like you mentioned, Florida A&M, in terms of to, to have these certain substances tested. So it was a, a thorough investigation and in every case should be investigated like this. Agreed. Our next case is out of Denmark. We're going international today. There are children of an heiress who have been kidnapped. This all happened while watching New Year's Eve fireworks with their father. The case is making international headlines because of the rich and high-profile divorce and custody battle, and now this really unusual kidnapping. So police say that the children, a 49-year-old German steakhouse heiress, Christina Block, were kidnapped from a cafe on New Year's Eve while watching fireworks with their father, Stephen Hensel. The children are Clara, who's 13, and Theodore, who is 10. According to the Telegraph, Danish police, everything's happening here between Denmark and Germany. Danish police report that a group of men knocked the father to the ground, roughed him up, and then took the children in two German rental cars. At least the rental cars had German plates. And so the significance here is that the mother is German, she's in Germany, the father is in Denmark, and the crime happened in, in Denmark. So you know, Robert, these, these custody battles, whether you are rich or you are poor, often have a lot of similarities in how people are fighting with each other and how children are fought over and pulled apart. And, you know, the difference here is that you have very, very rich people, but people without means have the very same troubles. This one just becomes so big because of, of this kidnapping allegation. Yeah, um, there's a different aspect when we have the, the international aspect, the wealth of the parties, the, the kidnapping. But whether, regardless of the person's income, these cases can be contentious. Regardless of income, families love their children. Regardless of income, families or these parties can sometimes use their, their children as its pawns, so to speak, in order to, to hurt the other, um, the other person. So it doesn't matter in terms of where it takes place or the income of the parties, the love for the children are going to be something that's going to be paramount or something you see in all of these cases. The reason I found this case so interesting, besides the fact that it's it's very high profile, it's a big, big story in Europe, it's, it's the kidnapping of the children. Because, you know, oftentimes in these cases, there are parental abductions. But I don't know, and the police are investigating whether the custody battle has anything to do with the kidnapping, but isn't it kind of weird? Police haven't said anything about a ransom. We haven't heard any information about the whereabouts of the children, at least at the time of this recording. Who took the children and why, Robert? Yeah, and that's one in terms of does lend itself to, to speculation and that we've all seen these types of movies in terms of family member children are kidnapped and then there's some type of ransom note or call and then law enforcement would say, well, hey, we got to keep this close to the vest. So there's obviously that aspect when you're dealing with people of a certain income, or it could be in terms of one spouse having or having it orchestrated to look like it is a, a kidnapping in order to get the children away. So it just lends itself to a lot of different scenarios that at the moment, we just don't have enough information to know which way to go. No, we don't. Christina is the daughter of steakhouse mogul Eugen Block, who has an estimated fortune of $330 million. She and her two siblings have equal shares of the company, and the businesses run a very popular and lucrative steakhouse chain and a chain of burger restaurants. Okay, now Christina and Steven, the couple here, the one in dispute, they have four children. Here's where I think things get very interesting. The couple divorced in 2018, and then they began this long and bitter custody battle over two countries. 
Now, according to published reports, the German courts where their mother lived has ruled that the children should be with the mother. But the Danish courts where the father lives have ruled that the children should be with the father. I know you're not a family court attorney, but what in the world do you do with two jurisdictions, two countries? Yeah, when you have two di different jurisdictions and two different rulings that are opposed to each other, then obviously the argument is going to be that one can say, I'm going to follow this one. And one says, well, I'm going to follow this one. And are you in a violation of either court when you don't follow the other, the other court? For instance, if the mother takes the children, she's obviously following the court in Germany. Is she held in contempt? Is that a violation of the court in Denmark or, or, or vice versa? So it's always, although I do not do family court at all, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but when you have, but I've been in situations of where you may have one judge doing something, one judge says something else, and you're in that in the middle, sort of a ping pong, so to speak. And that's not a, a good place to be. You always want to get out of that and get it resolved. So in this case, either party can say that they are in the right by following the ruling of the court in their home jurisdiction. It's crazy making. You can't split these children in two. The children can only be with one parent in one pl at one time in one place. So, I mean, this is absolutely crazy making that you have these two radically different rulings. And I don't know how this dispute is solved. Like It's almost like, that's it. Both sides are entrenched and, and, and no one's going anywhere. So uh, there are older children. We said there are four kids here. So the oldest daughter, Joanna, is 17. She reportedly lives with the father in Denmark, but the 15-year-old daughter, Greta, lives with the mother in Hamburg, okay? So you can see like everything is split here. Now the two youngest children, the ones who have allegedly been abducted, because again, it's the words that police use to describe the alleged kidnapping as if they're a little suspicious. So we don't know what happened to these kids. We really don't. But I am worried for their safety because whether they were kidnapped by people who were trying to take advantage of the wealthy family they come from, um, people who had sinister intentions, or if it's you know some faction within the family itself, this is a traumatic event, what has been done to these kids. Oh, this, is definitely. Not, this is not all right, you know. Hello, adults here, you know, pay attention. Um, so the little ones, the ones who were abducted, uh, they live with their father in Denmark. So the mother in Germany says that the father is very controlling. She says that in 2021, she told a German newspaper that the father had allegedly kidnapped, this is her words, when the children were on a visit, refusing to return the children back to Germany. And then the father said, well, wait a minute. The children didn't want to go back to their mother. They want to stay with him. And then he said that the mother was physically and emotionally abusing the children. So the children were then in the custody of the father. I mean, it doesn't matter what language you say this in. You see this over and over again with divorces. Yes. And like I said, so I don't do family law, but I know a lot of family law attorneys, and this is a common scenario that they face of where there's a custody issue and one parent may keep the child and not bring the child at the designated time. So it does, like you said earlier, that regardless of if it's just a custody dispute or something more sinister, the safety of the children is what's most important in all parties if it isn't something nefarious parties should be able to come together and work this out for the benefit of their children. And it's not just the parents we're feuding here. It's the extended family. And then, you know, again, you see this here in the United States with families that are feuding where if the children miss certain huge events in the family because of the dispute, for example, when the children's grandmother, Crystal Block, 82, died, the children were not allowed to attend the funeral, say their goodbyes, which really upset the mother's family. Um, and then the grandparents have said, and the grandparents are very prominent in Germany, they've said, you know, we've tried to send gifts to our children in Denmark and the father refuses to accept them, calling the police and claiming that we have sent a bomb to the children. So it, this is something that's like really, really escalated here. It's again, not just the parents, but the extended family and then the accusations, you know, how do I know what was in that? I think it was a bomb. I mean, it's like, oh, wow, this, this, this really is very telling about 
the situation. And then what's also weird is on New Year's Eve, right, when the kids are kidnapped, you've got Christina and her family in Germany celebrating and they're at some, you know, event at a fancy hotel for the family's traditional punch under the roof, it's called. I don't know. I guess that's what rich people do. I don't know. Um, they're at some fancy five-star hotel. Christina makes a statement to everybody in the room about how, you know, she's decided not to hide anymore, duck away from these problems, you know, talking about injustices. Meanwhile, at the same time that this is going on there, all of a sudden, these men rush in and take the children. I, you know what it reminds me of? It's like feuding royal families in its medieval times. Hmm. So here's what we don't know, which is very important. Police have said, well, at least they, they haven't said anything publicly. They're wondering, is it possible that the kidnappers could have crossed the border? Because everything happened very close to the German-Denmark border. And there's also been a switch in the investigation. Here's what I find really fascinating. The German authorities have taken over the case, even though the kidnapping happened in Denmark. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, so both would have, in terms of thinking jurisdiction to investigate the case, certainly Denmark could say, well, it happened in our country, we're investigating the case. For Germany to come in, one hand, I would think, well, why would they get involved unless they have some information that the children may be in Germany? Not just that the mother resides in Germany, but you ha- I would think you'd have to have a little bit more in terms of in order to become involved. So it may be that they have information that the children, if they're not in the custody of the mother, but they are in Germany at this time. Maybe because the cars had German plates, the cars that were used to take the children, that, that could be part of it. It's It's just very disturbing. Now, for two parents who have been so vocal to the media this entire time since the children were taken, neither one of them has said anything publicly. Don't you find that weird that they haven't made a public plea to help find their children? Um, I do. You would expect in terms of if there are true alleged kidnappers that they would make some type of public plea for the safe return of their children. For them not to say anything, I'm going, well, is law enforcement directing them not to say anything, which may sound odd in and of itself? Or do they know more and no one is just coming forward or making a public statement? You really think these rich people are going to listen to any cop tell them what to do? Please. (laughs) Whether they're in Germany or Denmark, these two aren't going to listen to any officer of the law tell them anything. Well, unless you say, well, 1%, regardless of what country they're in, are going to act generally the same. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, a, it's an international standard. It is time for our comments section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about on social media. Here's our producer, Will Updike. Hey, Will. Hey, Anna. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good to see you, Robert. How's it going? I'm doing fun. I hope you're doing well. Doing well. Uh, this case, we have a case of a hot dog hero. Uh, This case comes out of Safety Harbor, Florida, where a family dog saved a teenage boy from a house fire on New Year's Eve. So we're doing something a little bit different this week. Uh, Nicole Evans, uh, the the homeowner here, was out of town over the holiday while her son Griffin and the family dog Macho were at home. So tragically, mom is out of town. The house catches fire like the roof of the building is blazing and Griffin, the teenage son, is asleep inside. So in what could have been a devastating loss, the family dog Macho stepped in to save the day with his actions. According to the family, Macho sensed something was amiss and he tried to rouse the sleeping teenager. Unclear what methods he fully tried, but he started nipping at the kid, Griffin, here to get them to wake up. And he's nipping at him and nipping at him. Um, and, and just a side note here, uh, Nicole, the homeowner, said that the dog really isn't a barker. So I, I, you know, I don't know if it if it tried to let out a couple barks and that wasn't working, or if it if it had to go straight to the to the nipping action here. Um, but so once he was able to rouse Griffin in this situation, um, you know, Griffin could tell right away this was this was very serious. He had to exit the house, um, and they got out of the house just in time before the roof of this home actually collapsed due to the fire damage. Oh my god! So. 
The mother ends up finding out about all of this, you know, on a telephone call because, like I said, she's out of time, out of town at the time this place happens. She said she told news outlets later it's probably the worst experience of my life to not be with the person you love the most while something's happening to them that you can't do something about, can't even imagine. So the mother here, Nicole Evans, has lived in the Safety Harbor community for about two decades, and thanks to the actions of Macho here, the whole family will continue to live there. And the house here, uh, unfortunately, was deemed a total loss due to the blaze, but community members have kind of stepped up to show support, help out this family. So far, the cause of this fire is still under investigation, they, they they didn't say exactly where the blaze started, but if you see the roof, that's like where a lot of the damage was sustained. This is just only my 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 theory. This is based on nothing. I'm wondering if there was some sort of fireworks incident over New Year's Eve. Oh, that I'm makes like, perfect I'm, I'm sense. I'm really curious if there was some sort of uh, something that went on there yeah. because things can things can kind of go amiss, and this one was kind of kind of odd. Um, we got a bunch of comments on this one. People love animals. We have a tragic story of two animals dying in this one. Figure we got to round it out with something positive uh, with the animals. Melissa C said, animals know when they are truly loved by their owners and when they know they will go above and beyond for their owners. Very true, very yep. true. Um, <laughs> Erica Y like this one. They said, wow, it's amazing that I'm actually seeing something positive. I didn't think it was possible with all the evil in the world. Um, yeah, good start to the new year. Good start to the new year. I I asked people to sort of uh, leave a little comment uh, if they had a hero pet about about an Aww. instance or something that happened. Um, and we got a couple that I'm going to read for you. So Daydream Ride said, my border collie saved my son and small puppy from a wolf coyote hybrid by circling the coyote hybrid and running it off. Um, oh very God. brave very brave actions here um and then this one's a longer one but i i really liked it Haley h said we had someone break into our house while i was there with my newborn the person was having a psychotic episode we had our rescue special trixie for about three years now she goes on to say that trixie is like an 80 pound potato her words yeah. uh, uh she lays around does not have a mean bone in her fat body she has come to my job uh, as a long-term care nurse to help care for the residents. Uh, but this day, uh, <laughs> Trixie snapped into action. She planted herself between me and this person. She didn't allow them to come near me. She only growled when they tried to approach. Then police came. She went right back to being her potato self. Never had to do it ever <laughs> since, which thankfully, <laughs> knock on wood, she doesn't have to do it again. Um, but those are some good stories. Want to start off this new year with our with our first fresh recording with some, some good stuff. Um, so yeah, yeah. It's not I all like bad. that, Will. I it's really do. It's not all do. crime. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Absolutely. I, I, oh my gosh. You know, m my little Chihuahua Jackie O passed away a year ago. I mean, she was eight pounds. You know, but whenever anyone came to the house to do any work, especially you know how workers have those steel-toed boots. I mean, they're really big boots. And she, I was missing half her teeth, but she would go after their boots and their ankles <laughs> with everything. <laughs> that she had <laughs> I, I was always marveled at how you know no matter how tiny she was she was like mm -mm, you're not getting in here <laughs> <laughs> they are special they are thanks thanks for that will makes me feel better absolutely uh, but that'll do it for this week's comment section uh quick one this week and i will see you all next week totally Robert, thanks so much for joining us. This has been, you know, our special first of the year edition. And it's always good to see you, Robert. And, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of comfort in, you know, things that are traditional, little things like, you know, I'm starting year four of the podcast, but I'm still using my nutty little milk bottle for my water. And like, you'll always, everyone's like, what does that woman drink out of? <laughs> my Barry Mason. <laughs> my Perry Mason promotional jar. You know, sometimes we have to keep some constants. I'm really excited. This is year four of the podcast. And thank you, Robert, for being such a big part of it. Oh, thank you. I always enjoy participating. It's, oh, it's always such a great pleasure. So, Robert, where can people find you on social media? Because uh, you're doing all sorts of great commentary on crime shows. I'm, I see you all the time now. It's so exciting. Well, um, thank you for having me here. That's the only reason why anyone else will want to hear me speak. Um, but um, I'm on X and Instagram at Robert K. Corbett ESQ. So I think the same handle for both. 
I do pride myself in discovering you. I found you, you know, reciting all these like lines from movies. And I thought, who is this attorney? <laughs> you don't do that much anymore. Well, uh, just in terms of we had probably more free time <laughs> during COVID, uh, but my son and I still, you know, talk about, you know, do our lines here. Uh, we always say we're men out of time that we could have been a Volville act because we have that same type of humor. Um, but we'll, we'll get back to it and try to put some more things up. Oh, so funny. So entertaining. So cool. Okay. And you can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. Um, I do post about crime, but recently I've been posting a lot about rescue animals because all the shelters are full, full, full. And I just want to let you know, uh, we just, ha we rescued a Corso, a female Corso pregnant. These dogs are enormous. Pregnant. She gave birth to 13 puppies over no two days days and our rescue a purposeful rescue got their hands full with these 13 babies and then there's another case that went viral maybe you all saw it in november where there was this video of this dog in a metal cage at the shelter and she's in the corner like this and she's shivering and shivering the video went viral that was our dog we rescued her her name is comfort she's about six months old she's finally feeling more like herself She's available for adoption, people. So we got a lot of animals out there, purposeful rescue, or just follow me at Energy News. Um, you know, I always welcome your comments and uh, love to hear what you're going to have to say this week. So this episode, all our episodes, you can get wherever you get your podcasts. We have so many amazing and special podcasts out there. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, More Than 5 Million Strong. Sign up for our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. Um, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime.